Welcome, Next Levelers. Glad you're with us today. This is Bob Gibbons, your host for the Next Level Show. And, you know, we're here to learn from people that have gone before us, people that have built companies, grown things, and learn from them why things have worked, what hasn't worked, how to overcome challenges, all kinds of stuff like that. And today is no exception. we got a great guest today, but you know what? Whenever you're thinking about a new idea and you're trying to decide how to make that happen, so let's say you got some some uh, new app you want to create or some some uh, something that requires technology, but you're not a coder. What do you do? I mean, we've had a lot of people on the on the show that have not been coders. They haven't been technical people, but they've wanted to do something that required tech. What do you do? Well, our guest today is Jason Taylor, and he is with a company called Code Authority. And CodeAuthority.com is where you need to go to check them out. And they've been in business for 18 years in the Dallas Fort Worth area and have around 40 employees now. So they've grown a pretty sizable organization helping people do just that kind of thing. Welcome to the show, Jason. Good morning, Bob. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Excellent. Well, we're excited to have you here. So, you know, there's so many people that I've talked to that surprisingly have built tech companies without being a tech person themselves, or they've had some tech-enabled opportunity that they've needed to create to help their company, and, uh, and yet they didn't know how to do that. And that to me, it always seemed a bit foolhardy for a non-technical person to have a company that relies on tech. But with somebody like you, I guess that's not really all that necessary, is it? Because they can hire you to do that. Well, yeah. So personally, I am a tech guy, and that's how I started Code Authority 18 sure. years ago. So Code Authority builds software development applications for businesses. Um, sometimes large and sophisticated businesses, sometimes very small startups. Mm-hmm. And being in that role, we kept finding the, the same thing over and over, which is really interesting people with really good ideas that were coming into our conference room to meet us after they had made a really bad first step <laughs> with their technology build yeah. and had gotten themselves stuck in a, in a really bad situation and fallen into that classic pitfall. And oftentimes they wanted to hire us, but they were now out of money and wanted us to invest in them at the end of the sales cycle. So we would get to the end and be like, oh man, this is a letdown. We would like to invest in you too, but we don't, we have a certain amount of resources and it, it may not look as, it may, it may look like we can just throw free people at anything all the time, but we can't do that. Yeah. It has to be very structured and very careful how we do that. Interesting. So eventually we created Code Launch to solve this problem and to provide a way f- to help these people and to hopefully help them before they make that first bad step. So yeah, the whole idea is there are business people all over Texas and DFW and the nation who have an idea that's been bouncing around in their head maybe for weeks, but maybe for years. And they don't know how to make that first step with the technology part. Right. You know, we've had a few people on the, on the show that, as I mentioned, that, you know, started something and didn't know how to exactly accomplish that. And they've taken one of two routes. In some cases, they've hired an individual, somebody that they knew or somehow were introduced to that was purportedly a great tech expert. And so they hired that person to do something and it, it just didn't work out. And then they have to hire somebody that does know what they're doing, a company like yours. But I've also heard a few situations where they've hired a company, but again, it didn't work out. They, you know, the one thing I keep hearing is they've, they paid for the, the tech in advance before they had any real proof that it was going to work. And, uh, and so those two are the sort of the two things that I hear uh, repeatedly. So what does somebody in that situation do to sort of vet the person or the company that they're going to hire and what's the appropriate way to, to pay for something like that? Not dollars amounts, but, you know, up front or not. That's a great question because that's another factor that determines the outcome of, of a startup like this or a new venture is how experienced is the team with developing technology and what is their expectations? Um, I think many times – they get the idea and the outcome stuck in their head and they try to find somebody that they think 
can make that idea outcome for a certain dollar value. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a, a classic bad way to look at it, even though our, you know, our nature of managing the cost is, is overriding everything. And, and, and that way, we're thinking, okay, we're trying to manage the cost to get this product launched. But it is nearly impossible to predict the cost of creating a new innovative product that is doing new things in ways that haven't been done before. Um, and so in that way, some of the smaller and medium size and, and less experienced companies who need the work will tell people what they want to hear, mm-hmm. not because they are um, trying to mislead, but I think they are looking at the same you know, rose-colored glasses outcome, and they think, okay, I can build this. And then the two of them go down a path together, and there's constant new questions and new challenges and answers to those questions which complicate and sometimes cause work to have to get redone. And then there's assumptions that certain technologies can be put together and to make this new thing. Oh. And you find out that it's harder than you thought or it doesn't quite do what it needed to. And so the chance that work has to be redone and uh, pivoted in the product vision at all times is very high. And so really a startup or a new venture founder needs to be prepared for time and cost overrun and hire a team that will tell them the truth that that is likely to happen. Yeah. So, you know, I see that happen in kind of, I, I do, I've done a lot of construction for, you know, I'm in the real estate business, commercial real estate business. So, you know, I've been around a lot of construction. And so we always try to have a set, you know, plans. We know exactly what the plans are. They're, they're checked by the city. We have a general contractor estimate it. So we do all that. But if the client then keeps changing the plans, we have what we call change orders and you can change order to death a, a project that then now you have all these cost overruns it kind of sounds similar in the same situation yes it's nearly identical we call it scope creep uh, um, or we call it sometimes gold plating hmm. and so uh, the client will start to fear that if this thing isn't perfect that it, the marketplace isn't going to accept its launch or you know they have a reputation to uphold they've been telling all these people about it and it's getting closer and they want to launch it, but they want the reception to be this uniform hurrah coming back in their direction. Mm -hmm. And they start to fearfully put every single little bubble gum and little bell and whistle on there. Right. And, um, those that costs time and money. And, you know, in startups, I feel like the number one thing that kills them is time. Um, just as much as lack of money. Yeah. So, Time is money, right? Yeah. Especially when they're hiring somebody else to, to develop the tech for them. Right. But I got to believe that there's, you know, the concept of a minimum viable product. And so do you find that clients feel that they understand minimum viable product or do they kind of feel like it's got to have all the bells and whistles from day one uh, before they can launch it? Well, I think there's different types of clients. And sometimes we're hired by groups that are sophisticated and they walk in the door. They've done this before. They want a vendor that works trustworthy and in a good manner with great tools and both sides understand what minimal viable product is. Mm-hmm. And other times it requires a lot of education. And so um, that education is really important. And the concept of a minimally viable product, actually, if you adhere to it, keeps you from gold plating. It keeps you from scope creep and it narrows down your idea of, of, of what the first version of your product should do and lets you shoot for a shorter, easier goal to achieve. So we are very high on the concept of MVP at Code Authority and Code Launch. Well, I would think so because, I mean, in, it seems like you don't want to have the whole gold plating business and all the bells and whistles because until you know that something's going to work, how can you predict what your customers are going to want in all those bells and whistles? I mean, you think about a lot of things – you know, uh, a lot of the big name things, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all these kinds of things that my, my kids have drugged me into using just because I'm trying to watch them and keep up with them. I mean, none of those seem to be exactly what they started to be. Right. So why would a lot of other things that would be created be that way? Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's totally within expectation to, to think that your product's going to require continuous evolution and development. 
too. So once you get to that launch point, you're probably going to be surprised by some customer feedback. And then you're going to want to put in changes or some ways it's being used are going to surprise you. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. When people, when we just start to discover looking at the data, people are using this in a way that no one ever thought of. Neither us, nor the startup founder. And um, so then you think, okay, well, are there new opportunities if we add certain new angles to our product and maybe this opens up new market ideas. And so really uh, startup founders that are business savvy, but not tech savvy need to be very well capitalized and prepared for, um, and be, to be flexible and prepared for constant change. Yeah. Now, do you guys focus on any particular industry type or vertical? We really don't. We've, we've done solutions and everything from college football to medical, uh, finance. Um, we recently did a cattle and agriculture markets product. Um, we've done things from uh, Ferraris and, and Lamborghini marketplaces to insurance and everything in between. Wow. That's really a huge, diverse client base that I wouldn't have expected. Well, people have probably have told me from time to time, and they might be right that we should have focused on one or two along the way. And, um, you know, I I might not quarrel with that argument, but we try to be really good at building products and it's up to other people to decide what we are going to build. Yeah. And so what we sell is a really competent practice for software development and product development. Interesting. Well, that's cool. Well, listeners, please go to codeauthority.com to check out more. We're going to take our first break and we will be back in just a minute. Welcome back to the Next Level Show. We are talking to Jason Taylor of Code Authority and Code Launch. Check them out at codeauthority.com and codelaunch.com. We'll talk about Code Launch a little bit later. But uh, Code Authority, so uh, Jason, whenever you started this company, I mean, what led you to start the company in the first place? Were you part of another company? Did you have other startups you had done? Well, this goes back to the um, middle 90s, and I had – I was kind of, I knew that I was really computer savvy and I was that kid that, that had like four telephone lines and a lot of modems <laughs> and I was really into every single thing that was new. This is back before Windows, okay? Okay. And I learned C++ programming and it just really like lit a fire in me. I really loved it. It was fun. And this is like what age? 93. I mean, but so your age 20. was. 20. Okay. Um. And so at that time, um, I decided, well, I need to try to find a degree path that'll let me be a programmer. Mm -hmm. And computer science had all this math that I hadn't done and was going to take forever um, for me to finish. So I found this degree called Management of Information Systems, and it was business classes with programming. Okay. And I was like, perfect. Um, Not as much math. And so I have never been a good um, geometry coder or physics coder or any uh, scientific type of coding, but I got really good at building business applications. And about that time, um, I started an ISP, so a dial-up. An internet small, service provider. Yeah, like with 10 f- telephone numbers. Like Netscape or? Yes, Netscape, all that. We're trying to kind of beat AOL online and um, actually provide access to the real internet, which at that time we thought AOL is this little like fake view of it that they just want to give you. <laughs> Why not have the whole thing? Yeah. Whatever you want to do. And, and are you doing this while you're in college? Yes. I was a senior in college and two other um, buddies of mine that we lived in a house together and we had this insane network in our house. Um, we started this ISB business and for the first year, it was really, really fun to run, but it wasn't making enough money for anybody to live on. It was making some money, but only enough to put back into it. So when I graduated, I just said goodbye to that. But that experience was really great. I mean, we were building shopping cart applications. We were building websites. We were building all sorts of things for our business customers. And the internet was brand new. So Yeah, 93. I hadn't even heard of it yet, hardly. I mean, I'd heard yeah. of it, but I didn't really know anything about it. I certainly wasn't using it. 
So I graduate in 94, 95, I go to Kansas City and work for Cerner. Um, very high profile, still public company in medical and health systems software development. Thousands of employees, lots of them software developers. And when I get there, I discover in my little class of brand new graduates of like 30, 40 kids, by far I had more experience and by far I had more passion for coding and by far I was better at it. Hmm. And so I decided that I should go out on my own a couple years later as a freelancer. And that's when I moved to DFW. So, so why DFW? Because DFW had a much bigger marketplace, um, economic size, and a lot more technology than Kansas City or Oklahoma City, where I was from. Okay. And I had some friends here, and I, I knew that because some of my friends had graduated and come straight here okay. from, from OU, where I went. So I came down here and immediately discovered that there were tons of jobs, and um, you know they were paying contractors by the hour come in and work on big projects all around DFW. And so I had a passion for working on new things from the ground up, what we call greenfield software development. And I didn't look for anything where I was going to do maintenance. I wasn't big on maintenance. Yeah. And so I tried to find those gigs um, as a contractor, and I did on a few occasions. But then, you know, my experience in being an entrepreneur a little bit in college and in business for myself, I just decided that I needed to be able to get on bigger projects. And to do that, I needed to set up my own shop, you know, go hunt for bigger projects and then hire people hmm. to help me get them done. And that's how it started in 2001. So how did you, um, how did you get your clients? I mean, what, what Craigslist. was Craigslist? Craigslist? Yes. So Craigslist. So what did your ad say? Well, the Craigslist was full of ads for contractors. Okay. And I would just reply to those ads and say, you don't need to hire a contractor. Oh, I see. W2, you can hire me in my small corp to corp deal. Okay. I had, I had subleased six cubes in a office um, at Parker and Toll Mm -hmm. in Plano. And um, so they had a surplus of cubes. They were kind of going through downsizing and I was literally paying $327 a month for six cubes Wow. I could use their internet, their printers, their conference room, and their and their data center room. That's fantastic. And so, you know, I got hired by some shady people at first. So, you know, we kind what of- What are they asking you to we, do? <laughs> I got hired by a startup MLM. Oh, no. Okay. Multi-level marketing. Never do business with a startup MLM. You know, you might not want to do business with an MLM in general, but <laughs> never a startup MLM. Wow. Um, so- they Just, wanted me to figure out their downline programming, and I figured out that it was impossible. Okay. They were promising I, things they couldn't actually deliver. Yeah, and when I told them, they acted like I was stupid and I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, no, I mean, this is not possible. Anyway, they eventually just didn't pay me, and then we had to get in a, a uh, lawsuit. That's no fun. But eventually, you know, I got on some more better projects and more sophisticated clients. So how did you graduate from trolling uh, Craigslist for business to actually – Getting business in other forms. What else did you do? Well, I remember saying, I have, to, I have to become good at networking. I need to start meeting people. I need to start putting it out there that I'm a business for myself. And I need to start making an impression and then asking those people for references and, and referrals and recommendation letters. Okay. And I started going back to everybody I knew and you know, making sure I let them know. And I don't know. I was just fortunate. I got hired enough. Um, I also had a good bookkeeper. Um, my wife at the time was a professional corporate bookkeeper and yes. accountant. Yeah. So she ran our, our QuickBooks like a professional from the very first day. And she was able to sit me down and be like, okay, this is how we're going to do invoicing. This is how we're going to do timesheets. This is how we're going to do commissions for salespeople. And she had a process that she brought in from her corporate experience and put nice. it in place. So that helped let me just focus on sales and software development. So when you got these six cubes, why six cubes? Did you have people that were coming with you? No, it was just me. So it was but just I knew you, I was had... going to add some. Wow. So um, I remember one, the first person I ever hired was an H-1B, actually. Really? And I didn't know anything about it, but I, I knew kind of what it was, but I didn't know what it took 
from an employer side to hire an H-1B. Yeah, I was just going to ask that. But I had a contact at Sabre Technologies um, that was an, an upper-level manager and had the ability to steer business to vendors. Uh-huh. And I knew him from a contract I'd done over there prior. And he took me out to lunch and said, if you'll hire my wife, who just got here from India, who's on an H-1B, she's a software developer and she can do good work for you, I will steer business your way. Oh, that's sweet. So I called up an H-1B lawyer. I was like, how do I do this? And I remember, it seems like it cost around $11,000 on the legal cost Wow. over maybe a year. But she ended up working for me for two years and was one of the best employees we ever had. And we went on and on and on. Eventually, she got unhappy with America and moved back to the to India. Wow. <laughs> did, did, did the guy <laughs> deliver on his steering business your way? Not really. Oh, no. He kind of d- tried to, but he had kind of overpromised a little bit. Okay. You know, it wasn't. But and at first, I was really disappointed by that. But just a few months later, I wasn't because she was great. And she helped us kind of grow at the beginning. Okay. She didn't cost a lot and she worked hard and she could do things. So I never, I got over it pretty quick. Yeah. So as you were starting this company, what, what did you find that was the most surprising in terms of say support you got from people or, or that you didn't get either way? Um, did, did anything stick out as that you look back and say, you know, this, this really stood out. Somebody really went out of their way to help me or, or somebody just, you know, really didn't come through at all, even though they promised. You know, I don't remember the negative things all that much because it never made sense to dwell on those. You know, you got to get past those and just get positive and sure. put things behind but you. But there's always challenges you have to overcome. Any uh, <clears throat> any challenges that, you know, but you I guys... have I have one particular business contact that became a friend and consistently threw business my way over the first seven or eight years. Mm-hmm. It probably helped a lot. His name is Mike Rorick. And he's still in business for himself now. He runs a company called Application Arts. Mm-hmm. And um, we had our first networking, networking lunch um, set up after I'd met him through another colleague and done a little bit of work. And he liked the work I had, he had found out I did. And he reached out and we set up a lunch on September 11th, 2001. Oh, my. So I called him and he called me around 10 a.m. and said, do you still want to go do this lunch? And I was like, well, I'm. I'm in shell shock mode right now. I don't know what to do, but we might as well do it. I was really looking forward to this opportunity to, to talk to him. Sure. So we went to the uh, Genghis Grill and sat there and watched the replays and the live coverage of that and, and just talked about 9-11 and patriotism for two hours and found out we liked each other a lot. And then um, – Many times at the businesses he was at, he threw me work. And so I've, I'd sent contractors into his office. I built software for him. Um, several different startups that he was at, different places he was at. Mm-hmm. And um, actually ended up on a hunting lease with him now. So oh, nice. I would say that he was a person that really impacted our beginning years in a positive way that went out of his way. Yeah. You know, that that's you mentioned 9-11. And it has, it's one of those seminal events in, in your life that – you remember where you were, like when JFK was shot and, you know, when somebody landed on the moon and, you know, on the rest. Everybody remembers those those moments and it, they're, they'll stick with you forever. And I'm, I'm glad to hear in your case that it created a bonding opportunity that has turned into a good long-term relationship, number one, but also a business uh, relationship as well that's been positive. So your lease is going to expire in the future, and you're trying to figure out how soon should I start working on that? Is it six months or a year or two years before my lease expiration? Well, there isn't an exact date. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and my clients always meet with me about two years before their expiration date, and we create a strategy. And then we review that strategy again a year later. And so we're always working toward what's right for them, not what they think might be an arbitrary date by which they need to figure this out. The keys in determining how much time you need are whether or not you're going to move, whether or not you need to expand, will there need to be construction on wherever you're going to go to, and all those things take more time. So do a strategy meeting a couple years out with your advisor, and that'll make things a lot more clear. For more information, please go to texastenantrep.com. That's texastenantrep.com.
Welcome back to the Next Level Show. Bob Gibbons here, talking to Jason Taylor of Code Authority. Check them out online at codeauthority.com, but they also have another uh, initiative called Code Launch. And Code Launch you can find online at codelaunch.com. And if you've listened to the show regularly, you've heard commercials that we've been running for Code Launch. So the Next Level Show is a sponsor of Code Launch that's coming up uh, on July 31st. And uh, so, Jason, what is Code Launch and why did you start it? Well, it's a one-day event that's all about startups. So it's part speakers that are delivering interesting topics. It's part um, a trade show with tables and brands um, trying to raise awareness and meet people um, to help evolve and develop their business ideas. It's part sponsors like you. Um, thank you very much for that, um, Happy to do it. for helping us. And then the premier showcase event is uh, later in the afternoon is a competition of national and international startups to uh, win the benefit of over $100,000 in services provided by sponsors like Code Authority, like other software developers such as Improving.com. Yeah. And Curtis and, Hyatt's been a guest on the show in the past, so we yeah, know, cool. know Curtis. Right. Curtis is one of our sponsors, so a key key supporter in Code Launch. Interesting. And so um, that's what it is. It's a one-day event at the Comerica Center in um, Frisco, Texas on July 31st. So it's a, a competition, effectively, it, in a way? It, it includes a competition. Um, but at at its core is the competition. Okay, so that's the sort of the that's seminal the premier event. entertainment part. That's right? the, that's the five o'clock in the afternoon. That's the five o'clock deal. That's the bar opens, the lights go down, the stage lights come up, and then we produce a really fun competition. So we've been running an ad for people to sign up to be contestants on mm -hmm. Code Launch, mm -hmm. and you mentioned to me earlier that you'll have hundred, hundred and fifty, whatever applications uh, for that. Who is the applicant for this event? Okay, so there are people that have startup ideas that are technology-based, and they're at the very early stage. Um, that means they're pre-MVP. We talked about MVP in the first yeah. segment. Um, if you're already at MVP, you're not eligible to be in code launch. And the reason that we did that is because yeah. in the, the industry of funding startups, um, angels and VCs and the like, they're really not interested in anyone who's pre-MVP very often. Okay. And what they want you to do is to get to MVP by yourself and probably even have some customers and revenue. And then they all want to talk to you. Sure. And so we're, we were like, well, we can bridge that gap. Instead of there being this massive crowd of people that never get to MVP because they screw up their technology and never get to market right, we can come in and find the very best ones and help uplift them over that ledge. So, um, so that's what our goal is in the competition part of Code Launch. So it's somebody who has an idea mm -hmm. and they haven't got that MVP yet, the minimum minimum viable product, but and maybe I mean, do they even know how to get to the MVP? From maybe their not. Idea? Maybe not. But they usually have. So we require them to have a pitch deck. So. If you're a startup founder and you are serious about your idea, at some point you're going to create a PowerPoint that has seven or ten slides that explains the market, what your idea is, what the opportunity is, how you plan to monetize it, who you are and who your team is, mm -hmm. and maybe who the competitors are or the space you're trying to disrupt. And so uh, if, if you have that, well then – we can also expect you to create some wireframes for the software that you need okay. to create that uh, or maybe even professional mock-ups of how it would look. So these startups have, have, have at least made that step. Um, they, they, it's not like they're just driving down the street, they hear it and they go and they just type in their idea and click send. Yeah. Um, so they've made some effort and probably spent some time and sweat trying to formalize and conceive their product and their space and how they're going to succeed. Interesting. But they're from all over the world, all over the nation. And um, we actually have four different categories this year for the first time. And what are those four categories? So we have an international category. <clears throat> um, uh, from that category, we're going to pick one winner 
and we're going to let them stream their pitch from wherever they are to our audience in Frisco on July 31st. Okay. And we have a bunch of people interested. Uh, I bet. And applicants. Um, we also have a youth, youth-led. youth So every year we, we have received a handful of applications from high school students or teams of college students. And those represent a certain opportunity, but they haven't been traditionally – the one that we want to pick as the winner because mm-hmm. we're trying to find potentially successful business right now. Right. So this year we created the student category and we're going to invite them to either pitch remotely or in person as the winner of the student division. And so that'll be decided. Both of those will be decided before July 31st. I yeah, assume the curation process happens after the final applications. Um, the applications or due May 31st, and then we start curating them through a formal process, and then we'll make our announcements on our YouTube channel about who the winners are and who the finalists are. Okay. And and just for clarity, this show will actually air after May 31st, but we're recording it before May 31st, obviously. So um, there's a little bit of a weird gap here. But, Got uh, it. All right. So those are two of the four categories. What are the other two? The other two are um, the two we're focusing on most, which is U.S. Commercial Venture, and um, social impact. So many of the ideas that we get aren't trying to be the next billion dollar Facebook, Twitter, Mm -hmm. Amazon. They're trying to impact somebody's or some space that needs, that's underserved or, or some kind of technology that could really help people in some way. And so we wanted to include those when considering who should be in our competition. And at our competition, we're going to have exactly three finalists. Um, From those three finalists, there will be at least one social impact, social change. And then there may be up to two other U.S. commercial ventures, and they could be from anywhere in the U.S. Okay. So those three um, finalists from those two groups will arrive here three days before code launch and get assigned a professional team of software developers, um, five persons strong each. Wow. And they will start to work on their product as fast as they can, and they will accomplish as much as their passion will let them before Tuesday at 3 p.m. So they, let me make sure I got this right. So these finalists, these three finalists each get five coders, professional coders, for three days. Yes. That is an unbelievable opportunity. My dream is for this to be like 10 finalists with companies coming in and all bringing in their team of five and we're all showcasing what we can all do and everybody's a winner. Yeah. But right now um, I have the support of improving, Uh um, thankfully, a very key important partner. And I think in the 2020 edition, we may have three to five more companies on board. So now this is your seventh year doing this. Yes. So why did you start this in the first place? Well, I started it because I wanted to, well, I knew there was opportunity in, in keeping these great groups from making these bad mistakes. Okay. And not just opportunity for them, but for us, because we eventually want to make investment deals in projects that we really like, but we are limited in how many we can do per year. So by creating this competition and this funnel, it allows us to put everybody in a group together and go through a process and really select the best ones. And then, so at Code Launch, after the competition is over, um, we will go back to the finalists and try to do deals where we get on their cap table. Sure. And we have you know, done quite a few deals like that in seven years. Nice. But we're not going to require it up front. And that is the huge differentiator between us and another traditional incubator or seed accelerator. Right. Um, most of those, those groups are going to require a few percentage points to come into their program. Yeah. In fact, my son just went through Y Combinator in Silicon Valley. Cool. Uh, he was there uh, January through March of 2019 uh, along with his partner. And, and yeah, they, they did have to give a certain amount of their company percentage of equity to Y Combinator. Now they also got cash in return, plus the ability to go through the uh, through the program. But you're right; it's an upfront th- deal. It's 
you know, they own it whether you found found it to be worthwhile or not. So in your case, these people come through this program, they get all this free stuff, and at the end of it, there's no obligation on their no. part to do anything with it. <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is, is manufacture really stellar-looking startups so they'll get into Y Combinator. Oh. So they'll get into the, the biggest and best accelerators in the United States or in the world. And if we can do that, there's no doubt we're going to end up on their cap table before long. Yeah. Um, and it's happened over and over. So I know my model is, is proven. Yeah. Um, you know, at the very beginning of Code Launch, the very first couple of years, we did require um, to do a deal right after Code Launch before we did the software. We discovered that was stupid. So we stopped doing that. And then we eventually evolved into where we have this hackathon now, um, professional hackathon that happens before the event. Mm-hmm. So that then you can be at the event, show off what we did, maybe win, maybe not. It doesn't matter. You're a winner if you're a finalist. Yeah, I mean, you're getting all that stuff for free for three The only difference between the winner um, and the other winners is they get more services after the event from sponsors. Yeah. So Interesting. Um, you know, we have legal sponsors, creative services sponsors. We have a great social media campaign sponsor this year called Social Media Torch. And Nicholas Gartside, and he's actually going to be the MC as well. So he's going to get to know these guys, and then the crowd is going to choose the winner. And then so they're going to get more services. But in, in all, we're giving away over a hundred thousand dollars in services to the finalists. And the the three days that they're actually coding, that's what's called the hackathon part. Professional hackathon. Professional hackathon, not just a hackathon, but a right. Professional. Because most hackathons are kind of like college kids and yeah, very early stage, early career coders that are just trying to cut their gotcha. skills. All right, we're going to take another quick break. We will be right back. But in the meantime, go to codelaunch.com and sign up to attend this event on July 31st. It's going to be fun. I can't wait to be there. Don't miss the 7th Annual Code Launch Startup Expo, July 31st at Comerica Center in Frisco. Meet technology startups from DFW, Texas, around the nation, and beyond, noon to 8 p.m., including the showcase event at 5 p.m., a national pitch competition with over $100,000 in services to the winner that the crowd will choose. Register to attend at CodeLaunch.com, the 7th Annual Code Launch Startup Expo, July 31st at Comerica Center in Frisco. We are back talking to Jason Taylor of Code Authority and Code Launch. And as I mentioned, please go to codelaunch.com, sign up to be uh, in attendance for July 31st for the Code Launch event, the cap, uh, capstone event that starts at uh, 5 o'clock that afternoon. But uh, there's more stuff going on that day and a few days before. So um, so we were talking about Code Launch and, and why you started it and all this kind of thing. And, and so what happens to these people after Code Launch? I mean, do they now go quit their jobs and run with whatever you guys have created thus far? Or, you know, sort of what, what normally goes on afterwards? It's a mix. Sometimes they are now equipped to make the jump. But other times they have already made the jump before they land in our application pool. Mm. And they may have built some software. Um, they may have made some progress, but they really need a professional team to come in and put in some solid scalable architecture or to add the one extra piece they need to really explode. So, um, you know, last year's winners had both already made the leap. One of them is um, a group called Countertop Smart from Austin. Hmm. And they were completely developing a new marketplace in um, remnant um, countertop pieces that are like quartz and marble and yeah, and granite, and all, granite and all the high end, and they were converting the trash heap at the yard, the stone yard, to a e-commerce marketplace. Oh, and they had already done it, and they already had activity um, within their own city of Austin, but they needed to develop a Craigslist model web application so they could expand beyond just Austin. But they, most importantly, they needed a mobile app that the stone yards could use to document their inventory and upload it. Okay. And they were going around themselves on a tour all week long and doing it by hand. And so they had a, a really good idea. They already had customers. They had a pricing. They had suppliers and they had buyers. But it was really primitive and they needed professional help quick. 
So that's an example um, of one of those. Okay, interesting. So they they had a business that was just being enhanced by technology, although it sounds like it was very much a, a tech platform applied to a almost a blue collar kind of uh, uh, job or, or industry. Yeah, it wasn't at the level of MVP yet. It was never going to get past two guys driving around the city, documenting what's in the stone yard without right. the stone yard's help um, and just paying the stone yard a fee when they sold one. Mm-hmm. So they needed to get to a scalable product. Gotcha. So it was minimum and it was viable, but it wasn't product. So that raises a question of, you know, these guys had this good idea. They wanted to apply technology to it and they wanted to create more specifically a mobile app. Mm-hmm. I hear a lot of people creating mobile apps and I've even had people tell me I should create a mobile app. And I keep thinking, why do my customers really want or need yet another app to download to their phone? Uh, How do I decide? How does anybody decide if that's really the right way to go? Well, that's pretty complicated. And I think it's up to each business. (laughs) That's right. We we still have nine minutes. (laughs) Wrap it up. And I think... (laughs) It's something that only each proprietor of their own business can really decide. Okay. Um, I agree with you that there's a little bit of probably app friction um, on downloading, installing, and using apps Mm -hmm. at this point, Um, whereas there used to be this, like, euphoria to get a new app. Yeah. And so I think that it's a decision that you have to make, and, and, you know, apps can be expensive. But there's also not every app has to be custom from scratch, you know, um, an app for a radio personality and a radio show, there might be a kind of cookie cutter one out there already that you could pay a small amount of money for. Right. And they just skin it around you and then boom, you got an app. Right. And if it lets you reach people, um, tell them who's on your show, um, access them via live stream more often, um, you know, maybe remind them at the time your show's playing right. with messages and it grows your audience. Maybe it's worth it. But mm-hmm. really, as a software developer um, and a CEO of a software development company, I'm really not the guy to tell you whether or not you <laughs> should Everybody do needs it. one, right? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, I was actually, whenever I was saying that somebody told me that I should have one, they weren't referring to the radio. They were th- referring to my real estate business. Oh, okay. But in my real estate business, you know, I'm a, I'm a tenant rep or a corporate real estate advisor. So my clients, on average, lease space once every five years. So they're not really thinking about this. I mean, once they sign a lease, it's kind of like, all right, we're done. We don't have to think about that for another four years until it's time to to deal with that again. So they really don't want to think about it too much throughout that time. So, you know, having an app for something that they aren't likely to think about much in between times doesn't seem like a smart idea. Now, it might make all kinds of sense at the time they need it, but not any other time. So I've I've resisted doing that, and actually I'm not aware of any any other competitors or people that do what I do that have one that I'm aware of. I'm not either, and I'm very familiar with the space. Okay, you know, obviously I've been in business for a long time too. Sure. So I would tend to agree with you. Hmm. Interesting. So um, so these guys, let's get back to Code Launch real quick. So they come in, they do their deal. Afterwards, they now you had, you had like 100, 150 applicants, uh, but you're only going down to three for the finalists. Mm. So Help me, walk me through the sort of how do you filter through 150 applicants to get down to three? That by itself has to be a major uh, effort. Well, the software that we have been building at CodeLaunch.com has been evolving itself over the last seven years. So we have a platform. Um, these applications have a lot of information. They have attachments that the founders have uploaded that include their pitch deck and their mock-ups everything about them and their team. Mm -hmm. And what we do on Monday, June 3rd, um, is we start the process of downloading all those and we organizing them by category, organizing them uh, by country and state. And then we just start hammering through them. And basically the first cut, after doing this for seven years, I can take a look at one, open it up, and kind of make a judgment about how much effort this person has put into this, how serious they are about it, by what is in the application. Gotcha. And so the first cut is pretty easy to make based on, is this really worth our time? Yeah. Are they serious? Or not. 
Yeah. And I don't have to meet them. Um, I don't have to talk to them or anything at that point. So we make it first cut, and now we know which ones we really want to put effort into. So the second stage of our process, me and some other trusted colleagues um, at Code Authority go through each of the remaining um, group, and we score them on six or seven different categories. And some of those categories are, for example, like, does, does it look like the Code Authority skill set is a match, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes a great startup, it's a great startup, but it's just not right for code launch because what they want to do is needs a physics engineer and we don't have one of those. And that's yeah. not really not what we do. So we're not going to advance them in the process, but uh, because they'll get a low mark on that one um, element yeah. criteria. So at the end of that process, we'll rank them all from high to low, and everybody does their scores independently. And then we sit down and talk about the rankings, and we choose the ones we want to actually have pitch meetings with. And at that point, we have meetings, sometimes via Skype, sometimes many times in person. Sometimes people travel here from faraway places just for the meeting to try to get into the finals. I don't blame them. I mean, it sounds yeah. like it's a would be a great investment. The winner from 2014 came from Boise, Idaho. Nice. And she came with her partner and showed up for the in-person meeting. And we were ready to do a Skype with her. She walked in the door. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> that is. We were really impressed. No kidding. And she ended up winning the whole thing. And that wasn't just part of it. You could see that she had a... I mean, it was she. She was overcome with the desire for her concept to win, and to succeed. And so, that's what we start looking for at that stage. Yeah, is the person and the team. Who is the person and who is the team? And that's who we're really going to try to pick from the the, the best three. Yeah, are going to be people that anyone in the audience can see are investable people to run a business. Got you. So let's switch back to Code Authority for a minute. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, something about college football and that you guys have a client that's college football. What? Tell me what that's about. Yeah, so one of our most fun projects and most notable um, visible clients is the college football playoff, specifically uh, you know, the CFP that now determines the semifinals and the national champion each year in college football. Not just for one conference, but for across the whole thing. The whole, thing. The whole shebang. Wow. So um, it replaced the BCS about five years ago. And at that time, uh, luckily for us, the college football playoff is based in Las Colinas. And they were putting out an RFP to build software that would um, run the committee meeting. Mm-hmm. And so we went through a crazy process and won that. And um, ended up building it, and still to this day we provision it, support it, maintain, um, continue to ans- enhance it, and run the run the software at every session when the committee meets to discuss the top twenty five and then ultimately who is in the top four. Interesting. So, so w- does that has that led to other kinds of college related uh, business? It has led to other. Sports innovation okay. opportunities. Yeah. It sure, it sure has. I would yeah. think that'd be very high profile. It's pretty high profile, although we're not allowed to um, to promote it in a way that's really over the top. There's a little bit of a cap on what we can say and do sure. about it. So we're not allowed to just flag uh, fly a flag that says home of college football playoff. or <laughs> Yeah, you're not officially endorsed by kind of thing. We certainly can't use the word official. Yeah. So we don't. I understand. Um, but if you walk into our office, you're going to see some college football playoff logos. Be hard to miss. Yeah, it's going to be hard to miss. <laughs> well, Jason, thanks so much for being our guest today. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, listeners, please go to codeauthority.com to check out the company. Go to codelaunch.com to check out the competition that's coming up and to sign up to be there. Uh, and for the show, you know where to find us. Next Level Show, thenextlevelshow.com. Make sure you put the the on there. Uh, and if you want to find us on podcast or on YouTube, again, just search The Next Level Show. You'll find us, see all of our history. Thank you so much. Be back next week. Bye.